Well, we're gonna we, we're in uh, we've been in Revelation the last couple uh, weeks, but we flipped over to Chronicles. We're gonna pick up again in First Chronicles today. First Chronicles, chapter seventeen, probably about the ninth or tenth uh, book in the Old Testament. The thirteenth book in the Old Testament, First uh, Chronicles seventeen. And last week, the last uh, we talked about chapters fifteen and sixteen. You remember we talked about in chapter 15 how David was returning the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. We uh, briefly talked about that a little bit as far as how they were not bringing it correctly. Uh, God had told them the Levites would carry it on poles. They'd put it on a wagon. The wagon had toppled a little bit. A guy reached out to, to hold it. He touched the Ark of the Covenant and died. And David had good intentions, but he was doing it wrong. And Uzziah, I think, was the guy's name. He had good intentions, but was doing it not as God prescribed. And eventually, David went back in chapter 15 and said, or chapter 16, now let's do it the way the Lord has told us to do it. They brought the Ark of the uh, Covenant, the Ark of Testimony, to Jerusalem. Chapter 16, David then praised God. All through chapter 16, there was some praises. We talked about those last week as well. Three uh, areas that said praise the Lord or sing to the Lord. And then right after those three sections... It gave us the reason why to praise the Lord. We have unlimited reasons to praise the Lord. Amen. When people say, well, I'll praise the Lord when he has something to praise about, guess what? You'll never probably praise him then, because if you don't already see the many blessings he's given you, you probably won't. So the Lord is worthy of our praise, regardless if he ever does anything for us. His name is praiseworthy. In, in, even in spite of it, even though he is worthy of our praise, regardless if he does anything, what more should we praise Him when He does so much for us? We may not think of the air we breathe. Guess who created the air we breathe? Maybe you had some turkey or some ham or some stuffing this last week. Maybe you had too much and some gravy. He could have given us food for nourishment that had no flavor. Who's glad there's flavor in food? Yeah, He, he gives us that flavor on top of the nourishment. He has flavor with it. Uh, today coming in, I don't know if you all saw these roses that sprouted up back here. I think... Uh, Lorraine and some people were talking about those roses that popped up today. Uh, the beauty of a rose. He doesn't have to do any of that. The smell of a rose. He gives us so many blessings if we would stop and think about them. I was reading a book some uh, week or two ago and it was talking about the blessings that God gives us and said if the stars came out only one night a year, how many people would stay up all night watching the stars? Because they're out every night, we kind of start taking it for granted, and we don't stop and think about the majesty and the awesomeness of the God we serve. You know, he knows every one of those stars' names. He calls them by name. How much more are those stars that he loves that he's loved you, a human being? He loves us with an ever-ending, undying, infinite love. He loves us so much, you know, he gave his son Jesus Christ to die for our sins. We could go on until he calls us home or two returns, one by one going around this room saying, praise the Lord. And I think we would, I like John's gospel, the end of John's gospel. It says, if everything Jesus did was recorded in books, all the books in the world couldn't contain the things Jesus did. Boy, that is an awesome verse, isn't it? We miss that sometimes, but it says, John says, if, if we listed everything he did, we'd run out of paper. We'd run out of ink. The, the books couldn't con contain the many, many things Jesus does for us. And so that was chapter 15 and 16, and today we're in 17, and David has this, from chapter 16, has such a large desire to worship and to praise God, he has such a desire, he says, I want to do something for the kingdom, I want to give something. Uh, many years ago, I, I've told you this before, my grandfather said the, his favorite nine words in the Bible are, for God so loved the world that he gave. You know when someone really deeply loves you when they're willing to give you something. When they say, oh, I love you, that's good. I love you, and here's a meal. I love you, and here's a, a free car wash. Or so, you know, they get that something. is like they gave me something. That takes it to another level. And so David here in his praise and his love <clears throat> for God says, God, I want to do something for you. And so that's where we get in chapter 17 uh, of, chapter, of 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1. And it says, it came about when David dwelt in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I'm dwelling in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under curtains or sheath. It's still in a, a tent. Then Nathan said to David, 
Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. Now, I will tell you, and we're going to see here in just the next few verses, that is not good uh, godly wisdom. Do all that's in your heart. What does the Bible tell us about our hearts? I'm thinking of Jeremiah 17, 9, and it's in my notes, so if you uh, aren't know, know exactly what I'm saying, then you'll hear it know in a moment. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. If anyone tells you, and you hear this in the world today, well, the heart wants what the heart wants, just do what you want. I talked to someone here this last week or two, and I said, if you would learn to quit doing what you want and start obeying God's word, your life would be way easier. But the world will tell you, whatever's in your heart, do it. Trust in your heart. Folks, I'm telling you, do not trust in your heart. So we see right here when Nathan says this, David, do all that's in your heart. That is probably bad advice in the world we live in today. Because the Bible tells us our hearts are wicked. Our hearts turn to sin pretty quickly. We have got to come as believers in Christ. I don't expect and nor should you expect unbelievers to behave godly, should we? We have, we have no expectation of the ungodly to behave godly. But we that call ourselves Christians, we say we're followers of Christ. Do we have an expectation that we should follow God's word and lay down our wants and our desires? Proverbs 16.25 tells us there's a way that seems right to a person, but the end there is, is death. Anyone, anyone heard that? If it feels good, do it. Follow your heart. Do what you think best for you. Your truth, follow your truth. Folks, I'm telling you, there's, that is nowhere godly nor biblical advice. Nike, Nike yeah. Yeah, Nike says that. But that, that's, but that sells, doesn't it? The, the world system loves that. Be true to your heart. Well, folks, your heart will not be true to you. But you know what will be true to you? God's Word. It'll always be true. So Nathan tells David here, I just say that because when David says, do all this in your heart, I'm thinking as soon as I read that, ooh, boy, that, that sounds like trouble. And then as we read in the next few verses, <coughs> pardon me, it says, it came about that same night, the Word of God came to Nathan saying, Go and tell David my servant, thus saith the Lord, you shall not build a house for me to dwell in. Now, does David have the right intentions here? He wants to do something for God. Not only is it that we need to do something for God, but we as individuals and as families and as a church family need to do what God tells us to do. So often I hear people say, well, we need to not necessarily hear, but I hear churches and pastors say, well, our church wants to do what they want to copy what the church down the road's doing. And we're trying to copy that program over there. And we're trying to copy what they're doing. Folks, we need to be Autumn Creek Baptist Church. We need to do the job that God tells us to do. And uh, you see that in the Old Testament. You see a lot of that where God, the sons of Korah, they were the ones that were instructed to carry the uh, Ark of the Covenant and all the instruments of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And they said, well, we want to do the fire. We want to be the, the uh, priest to do the sacrifice. And God said, that's not the assignment I've given you. Out of all the peoples, I've given you the duty to carry the instruments of the temple. And they said, that's a great honor to carry the instruments of the temple. I've given you honor. And they said, yeah, but we want something different. If you get into a ministry that God's not called you, you're probably not going to do really well in that ministry. Now, I will tell you this, folks. Everyone in here, everyone in here has an assignment from God. Everyone in here has an assignment from God. Don't worry about doing what you want or don't worry about what the person next to you is doing. You find out what God has told you to do and you do what God has told you to do. And God will take care of everything else. We get in trouble. Ross, I don't like the way you do this. I don't like the way you do that. Chance, you need to do this. You need to do... Folks, that's, that causes trouble. Now, if you go to, hey, Ross, if Ross comes to me and says, Brother Dale, you said something last Sunday. I think it means this. Let's talk about it. Let, let Mr. Vidler just a moment ago was back there. He grabbed me and, hey, I got a question about something. Or let's talk about this for a moment. That's different than telling someone else, you need to do this, you need to do that. Clearly, if they're in sin, you go to them as a brother or sister in Christ and say, you're in sin, you need to pull back from that. We speak the truth in love. But don't worry about what God's told the next person to do in their ministry. And don't throw rocks. You, you've heard me say this before. I don't personally, I don't like when people throw rocks at Joel Olstein. That's not my business. Use that energy to go knock on a door across the street and tell someone about Jesus Christ. 
Don't worry about what he's doing over there. Don't worry about what that guy over there is doing. Just, just focus on what God's told you to do. But so, sometimes we get so busy in someone else's ministry, we're not doing our own ministry. And so here God tells Nathan, go tell David. Don't tell David to do everything that's in his own heart. That's not what I wanted. I never told David to build me a house. And, I never, and God never told Nathan to tell David to go build a house. So God says, tells Nathan, go and tell David, my servant, you shall not build a house for me to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house, verse 5 of 1 Chronicles 17. For I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up Israel to this day. But I have gone from tent to tent and from one dwelling place to another. In all places where I have walked with all Israel, have I spoken a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built for me a house of cedar? Maybe before we start doing stuff for God, we should ask God, God, what do you want me to do? Instead of saying, God, here's what I'm going to do for you. God, what would you have me do for you? And that's exactly what David should have done. That's exactly what Nathan should have told David. When David said, I'm going to build a house for God. Nathan should have said, did God tell you to do that? Is that God's will? Now, I know that's in our culture today, that's, you know, oh, they're being negative and you're being this. No, that's godly advice. Do what God has told you to do. If there's, there's some main dominant things, themes in the scriptures, and one of them is obey God's word. Adam, Eve, do not eat from this tree. Don't you wish they would have not eaten? <laughs> as quick as I say that, and I've often said also, everything would have been perfect till July 14th, 1964. Because that's when your pastor entered this world. And I would have went right over that tree and grabbed a couple of those apples and ate them. <laughs> you know, I admit who I am. I'm a sinner, but thank God I'm a sinner saved by grace. And so he says, and God, so God tells Nathan, have I ever asked for a house? Have I ever asked that? Is that anything I've ever asked of you? I've asked of obedience is what I've asked. And so verse 7 then says, therefore, now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David. So he's, God's telling Nathan to tell David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be leader over my people Israel. Now I want to stop there for just a moment too and think about that. Where's God brought you from, and where has God brought you to? This verse is an encapsulation of David's life. David, you were a little boy that followed sheep in the world. You are now a leader of God's people in a kingdom. And God says, I did that. Some of us in here today might have testimony. You know, I once was out in the world following the sheep, following the sheep that had all gone astray. I was one of those sheep that all we like sheep have gone astray. I've turned to my own way. I did my own thing with my own people in my own way. And God called me out of that and brought to me where I am. That alone, we should give God thanks and praise till, for all eternity. God, I was, I was out on that edge of that cliff. Somehow, some way, you came and found me. You left the 99 and you came and got me. Why would he do that for us? There's no good thing in us that he should leave the 99 and come get us, but he did. Sometimes in my own mind, I get not visions from God necessarily, but I get images of Christ on the throne in heaven and God the Father telling Jesus the Son, Dale needs a Savior. Get off your throne, be born in a manger in Bethlehem, live 33 years and die on a cross and bleed, and I'm going to turn my back on you to cover the sins of Dale Lindman. You can put your own name in that same sentence. Why would Jesus have given up glory and a throne? Why would he have done that? Why would he become obedient even to the death of the cross for us? It's because of his great love for us. He did exactly his assignment that God was given him. Here's what Jesus said. I've not come to do my own work. I've come to do the work of him that sent me. Should that not be the rally call of every Christian. I'm not here living my life. I've laid my life down. I'm here to live the life that Jesus Christ has given to me. I'm here to, live the, I'm here to do the assignment Christ has given me. To him that knows to do good and does it not, it is sin. If God's told you to do something and you're saying, I don't want to, it's hard, it's cold, it's, I, I, it'll, I'll sweat, it costs money, I don't want to do it. Get up, quit doing your sin and get back into God's plan for you. 
was Jesus, oh, it said, we, I just said that verse a moment ago, Jesus was obedient to the death of the cross. Did he want to do that? You know, sometimes laying down our own lives and our own will, we have to die to self. You know, sometimes we even have to pick up our cross every day and die to self every day and follow him. That's the call that we're given. That's very different than if it feels good, do it. You could not probably get two more different messages. If it feels good, do it. Die to self, follow me. Die to your will. Die to your life. Die to your plans. So here is, God tells Nathan to tell David, tell David, David, die to your plans. Obey my word. Do what I say. Verse 7, again, I just read it a moment ago. It says, therefore, thus shall thou tell my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be leader over my people, Israel. I've been with you wherever you have gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. I will make you a name like the name of the great ones who are in the earth. This is one of those also, this chapter 17. It's, it's, uh, it could be, you know, we've talked a little bit about when God says something, it's as good as done. So sometimes God says stuff is in the past tense, but it happened yet. And I say that, we're probably not going to go into chapters 18, 19, and 20 next week. We're going to probably jump over to some Christmas or back to Revelation for a week or two till we get to Christmas. But uh, if you read chapters 18, 19, and 20, is all the battles that David has against the enemies around him. So when we read here in chapter 17, it says, therefore, uh, cha uh, chapter 17, verse 8, I've been with you, and I have cut off all your enemies. Well, when God says this in chapter 17, David's enemies weren't cut off yet. The, the, chapters 18, 19, and 20 starts cutting them off. So this could be a situation if it's a little bit out of place in time, chapter 17. But I think as we finish up chapter 17 here in just a, a few more minutes, you'll see why it might be out of place. God's making a covenant with David here. He's talking about a future event. Uh, and when we get here in a few more verses, you'll see it. But here he says, I've been with you wherever you've gone. Are you glad that God has been with you wherever you've gone? Who, who, who can praise the Lord that says he will never leave me nor forsake me? Whatever you're going through, he's there with you. I, I, amen, amen. So often, we don't want to be, who wants to be thrown in the fire? Not me. <laughs> I do not want to be thrown in the fire. And, and sometimes we might pray, God, keep me from the fire. And God's answer might be, no, I won't. But I'll be in the fire with you. God, keep me from the storm. Don't send me in that ship across the water. Don't worry, I'll be in the boat with you. But God, I don't want that. But that's what I want for you. I want you to trust in me. If someone says, don't put me in the storm, leave me on dry land, are you putting your faith in dry land or in Jesus Christ? You know, Jesus is the same God on land as he is on the water. He's the same God in the peace as he is in the storm. And I'm sure you've heard it said, and I've said it before, sometimes, he storms the, sometimes God calms the storm around his child, and sometimes he calms his child in the midst of the storm. Who gets to decide that? God does. He's God. We're not. So sometimes he might say, I'm going to leave you in the ship. I'm going to leave you in the waves of, of this life. I'm going to leave you in the storm until you realize I walk on water. And I can that quick say, peace be still. When you turn to him. When the, the disciples, we looked in, in our Bible study last Sunday in Mark 4, they were in the storm. The disciples were in the storm. And they were, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? Until they went to Jesus, they were dying. They said the water was coming in, the boat was getting swamped, we were sinking, we were dying. They, finally, they go to Jesus. And then Jesus gets, it's, and they say they found Jesus on the back of the boat sleeping. <laughs> Do storms allow, alarm Jesus? <laughs> storms don't allow Je, uh, alarm Jesus. And if Jesus is in the boat with us, should they alarm us? We got Jesus in our boat. We don't have to be worried about the storm. Plan for the storm, be aware of the storm, know it's there. But go to Jesus first of all, not last of all. As soon as the storm comes, drop on your knees. Before the storm comes, Lord, I know there's a storm coming. Help me through it. Be with me. Guide me. Lead me. Direct me. Direct my paths. Folks, you cannot go wrong with that kind of prayer meant from your heart. So God tells David, David, I've been with you everywhere you've gone. He could, is, is, he could stand right here today and tell each one of us individually, Wherever you're going, wherever you've been, wherever you are, I am with you. And he says he promises to never leave us and never forsake us. 
in the midst of the storms, in the midst of the peace, rain and sunshine, it doesn't matter. If God's with you, you have nothing to fear. He says, I've cut off all your enemies and I will make your name like a name of one of the great ones. You know, David was roughly 1,000 B.C., 1,000, 1050 B.C., somewhere in there. Now we're 2022, 3,000 years ago. And guess who we're still talking about today? His God made David's name great. Yeah, he's a prototype of Christ. We'll see that Solomon, his son, is as well. Uh, you know, kind of a foreshadowing. And so, whether David and Solomon, we might say how great they are, how wise they are, how mighty they were, they pale in comparison to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But he says, I will make your name great. In verse 9, he says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so they may dwell in their own place and not be moved again, and the wicked will not waste them away uh, anymore as formerly. <coughs> this is where I said we start getting to some prophecy. Israel was in the land of Israel, but were they removed from the land? So here what it says, I will put you in the land and you will never be removed. That at the time this was written was not just talking about Solomon and the Davidic covenant with David. It's talking about the Davidic co uh, covenant with Jesus Christ. It was, uh, I think it was May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again. And if you ever study on that, it's amazing. You know, it was after World War II, what is the United Nations all got together and every nation in the world, I don't care what the news tells you, I don't care what the PLO tells you, what, what you hear, do your own research, your own study. The whole world says there's this little area, used to be called the Trans Jordan or the uh, Palestine. There was never a, a nation called Palestine. It was an area of land that no one wanted. The Muslim world didn't want the land of Israel. It was desert, it was rocky, there was no growth there, there was no infrastructure, there was nothing there. And the whole world said, this people of Israel, these Jews need a place in the world to call their home because they're getting persecuted everywhere in the world. Remember, World War II just got over it. Adolf Hitler, the Gestapo, and Nazism, and all that. The whole world got together and said, we're going to give Israel this land that no one else in the world wants. And they, and they signed a document, and on May 13th, people went to bed. There was no nation of Israel. On May 14th, there was a nation of Israel. And when God says here, I, I will put you in the land and you will never be removed again. I believe that promise, God, it's as true as the day he said it 3,000 years ago. We saw it, some of us maybe have seen this in our lifetime or we certainly have our recent history, God fulfilled that promise. I don't believe Israel will ever come out of the, that land again. I don't care what the world does. I don't care what nations rise up against Israel. I'm making sure my phone's off. I don't care who does what. The next time we see Israel, I think, at war trying to get moved out of the land, I think we'll be back in the book of Revelation, what we'll pick up again in a few weeks. So God makes a promise here that they'll be, out, they'll be in their land, they'll be in their place, they will never be moved again, and the wicked will not waste them anymore as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will subdue all your enemies. So he says, even when Israel had the judges, Samson and Deborah, and all those judges back from the book of Judges before they had a king, King Saul, is that even back then God said, I will put you in a land and I will hold you there forever. Uh, I would encourage you, if you call that area of Palestine, to quit calling it Palestine, call it Israel. And I just say that because there are people that will not use the word Israel. Some of you know when I'm over in the Middle East, they'll even tell you for safety's sake, don't you, yeah, yeah, use the word Israel. You can get killed for it over there in some of those places. I will tell you, if you ever hear the word Disneyland... Over in the, if you're in the Middle East, Disneyland means Israel. That's what people say. They say, yeah, we're going to, to Disneyland. But uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that on camera, but I guess they figured out the code. But in any event, to this day, there are people that hate that word so much that by saying the word in some nations, you can get killed for it, for saying the word Israel, and they will call it Palestine. Folks, we always want to be on God's side. I, I think I, I've mentioned this before, too, during the, the Civil War People asked Abraham Lincoln, they said, you know, we've got people on the north praying that God is with us, and there's people in the south praying that God's with them. Whose side is God on? And Abraham Lincoln said, I don't know, but I know I want to be on God's side. So it's not an issue of God with us, which is wonderful, Emmanuel, God is with us. We want to make sure we're on God's side of issues. And God says, I will put Israel in the land, and they will never be removed again. Uh, and then picking up verse 11, when your days are fulfilled, 
that you will go with your father. So Nathan's, God's telling Nathan to tell David, David, when your days are fulfilled and you die, you know you're going to be with your fathers, then I will set up for one of your descendants after you who will be one of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build for me a house and I will establish his throne forever. Now a lot of times in the Old Testament, and you can miss a lot of things, there's a fillment and there's a fulfillment. The fillment of this prophecy is probably most of you are thinking Solomon. Because who built the temple? Solomon, we call it Solomon's temple. So he says, I will, one of your descendants will build a temple for me. And we say that Solomon. Now, interestingly, and if you do your study on this, Chronicles was written when the people came back from, uh, their, from their captivity. David was about 1050, 1000, 1100 BC, somewhere in that window. Chronicles was written with Ezra when they came back out of the land in about four, right, 500, late 400 BC. Three, 400 years after this, these events happened is when this was written. And Ezra writes, God's going to take one of your descendants and put him on the throne forever. Is Solomon still on the throne? So you see, a little bit was a fulfillment, a prophecy of Solomon. Your, one of your descendants is going to build me a house. But G, uh, God the Father is now switching from the physical realm into the spiritual realm, saying one of your descendants will be on the throne, David's throne, forever. We are still waiting for that. Now, a, a few weeks ago when we were in Revelation, I mentioned about uh, this concept of the kingdom is already but not yet. Is Jesus sitting on his throne today? But we might say, we know he's on his throne today, but he's not fully ruling over the world yet, is he? We still have human governments. We still have crime. We still have murders. We still have the problems of this sinful world. Well, we understand Christ is on his throne, but it's not complete yet. That day is coming when he comes back. That will be completed. But here where it says, I will put one of your descendants on the throne and he will establish your kingdom forever. He's not talking about the kingdom of David, the, the geographic, physical land on earth. He's talking about an eternal kingdom. And a few weeks ago when we were in Revelation, we mentioned that. It said the kingdoms of this earth will become his kingdoms forever. And he is the king of king and the Lord of lords. And we see that still we're still looking for that day. Who's still looking for the day when Christ returns? Who's going to be glad when the heavens open up and Christ descends with a shout? And all these demons and all the sins and all the problems of this world will be no more. I'm, I am, I'm ready today. I hope you are. Until he comes back, we have an assignment to do. Each of us individually, each of us in our church here, our family, Autumn Creek Baptist Church, we have work to do and assignment to do. Don't just sit on the sidelines until he comes back or calls you home. Plug in somewhere. So he says, I will, uh, your son will build for me a house and I will establish his throne forever, verse 12, verse 13. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And I will not take my loving kindness away from him as I took it from him who was before you. This is talk, he's telling David here, my loving kindness was on Saul, but I took my loving kindness away from Saul. Saul was no longer the one that was supposed to be on the throne of Israel. He said, God, the father here is telling Nathan the prophet, I'm going to put someone on David's throne that I will love forever. I will never take my loving kindness away from him. And that's God the father talking about Jesus Christ, his son. So we see this here written four or five hundred years B.C., but it's still a pro prophecy we're still waiting on where he comes back and rules on his throne over this world. Uh, and then verse uh, 14, I will settle, but I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. According to these words and according to all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. So David hears all this information. David would have gone to Nathan and said, Nathan, I want to build a house for God. Nathan says, go do all that's in your heart. We've already said that's bad, bad advice. Do what God tells you to do. Don't do what's in your heart. Do not trust in your own understanding. Trust in God's word. <clears throat> so God corrects Nathan and says, go tell, Na go tell David, here's the story. So Nathan goes and tells David, don't build a house for God. God's going to take one of your children, and one of your children will build a house for God, and his throne will last forever. And so Nathan goes and tells David that in verse 16. Then David the king went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? So as soon as David hears these words, what's his heart attitude? God, you are so, such an awesome God. All of chapter 16 was praising God, giving thanks to God, praising God. David comes and says, I want to build you a house. God says, no, don't build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. 
one of your descendants will build a house for me. Now, we're not talking about a temple anymore, are we? I think we're talking about the temple that's in heaven. In Revelation, we talk about that a little bit where it said the temple of heaven was opened and the ark that was in heaven was opened. And we look back, and I think it was in Exodus and Leviticus, that said the ark that was here on the earth, the temple that was here on earth, it said was an example of the temple that's in heaven. And we looked at Hebrews. You might not have been here. If you were, maybe you don't remember. We were talking about Jesus being a high priest that didn't go in a temple built with human hands, but built with heavenly hands, the temple that is in heaven. And Jesus went into the Holy of Holies with his own blood. Remember we talked about how the uh, priest way back then would have to go to the uh, basin of water and wash an animal and then sacrifice the animal on fire and then take some of that fire and come over here to this golden altar and put it on the altar and then kill an animal and had to put blood on his ear, blood on his thumb, blood on his toe, had to wear all these special clothes, went into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the lamb. He had to make sacrifice for himself, then sacrifice for the people. And we talked about in Hebrews, it said Jesus went in by himself, which would have been very startling to a Jewish mind thinking, how could this high priest have gone into the Holy of Holies by himself? Well, he didn't need blood for his own sin. And I had mentioned a few weeks ago, when what was the blood that he gave for our penalty and our sin? Where did he get that blood from? It came from himself, the Lamb of God. That's why he went into the Holy of Holies by himself. He didn't need to go in with sacrifice for himself. He didn't need to go in with sacrifice uh, for his own sins. And his own blood was used for covering our sins. And so in verse uh, 17, uh, verse 16, David's praising God, saying, God, who are Am, who am I that you would think of me this way? What have, there's no good thing in us that God would love us this much. And if we're honest today, folks, I think each one of us could say the same thing. God, you have brought me so far. Each of us in here could probably tell stories of the, the world we came from, the environment, the culture, the backdrop of our own individual humanity. M many of us in here might be from, if you look five, six, seven, eight hundred, a thousand years ago, our great, great, great whatevers may not have been serving the God of this Bible. What, what gods were our forefathers from a thousand years ago serving? I, I've looked it up. We're from up in Scotland here. We were probably serving Odin and the, the Norse gods and all those fake gods. That's my family hi history. That's where my family was serving a thousand years ago. We weren't serving Jehovah. And if you look at your family history, you go back 500 to 1,000 years, you might say, we were serving Eastern gods. We were serving... Gods from Africa, are we serving Canaanite gods? All these other gods, but God's called us out. Somewhere along the line, God's mercy got into your family's history and called us out of that and called us out of the mess of this world and brought us into the kingdom of His Son, into the kingdom of light. And we might say today, God, why would you do that for me? Why would you love me so much? Why would you send your son to die on a cross? And, and pay for my sins. And David here maybe not knows the story of the cross. I don't know exactly what he knew or what he didn't. But here he does say that same heart attitude is, God, why would you do something so great for me? Why would you do this? This was but a small thing in your eyes, O oh God. But you have spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. And you've regarded me according to the standard of a man of high degree, O oh Lord. God has treated us is people of a high degree. And each of us may know that's not who we are. We know what we came out of, maybe not 500 or 1,000 years ago. We might, know, we might know what we came out of 20 years ago or 10 years ago or 5 years ago. Where were we in our teenage years and in our youth? And some of us might hear say, there was no good thing in me. There was no reason God called me out other than one reason alone, God's grace. His unmerited grace his favor. For no reason other than his holiness, he called us out of that. And so David then in verse 18, what more can David still say to you concerning the honor bestowed on your servant? For you know your servant. Maybe you've been there where you're in your prayer time and like David, all of chapter 16, he, he's writing and he's writing out and we know so many Psalms that he wrote uh, in the book of Psalms and songs they wrote. Here he says, there's nothing more I can say. I, I've run out of stuff to say. It's so awesome. There's nothing else to say but just to worship Him in spirit. Maybe you've, uh, you've done that. You've been to going down the road and you start praying and praising and maybe there's a song on and you start singing and, 
And next thing you know, you're wiping your eyes and you're by yourself, but you're not by yourself. Jesus is there in the car with you. <laughs> and you just start praising the Lord and you just get caught up in your emotions and you're just like worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And you're like, God, I don't even have the, the words. If, and if I don't have the words, Father, just listen to my heart. And God hears that heart and He hears that praise that comes not even from our lips anymore, but it goes into another level a deeper level of praise. And that's what David here says is, I don't even have words. What else can I say to thank you? O oh Lord, verse 19, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you have wrought all this greatness to make known all these great things. And David finally comes to the conclusion that we're talking about, God, it's all because of you. It's not because of me. So sometimes we might wonder, why would God do this for me? Me is not the subject of that sentence. The subject of the sentence is, why would God? And it, we just said, God, why would you do this for the world? And as I said that verse earlier, and I can say it again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with God. And so David said, I'm going to build you a house. And God says, you're not going to build me a house. You're talking, David's talking about an earthly temple to put this Ark of the Covenant in. God's saying, I'm going to build you a house in heaven, a, 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 a vastly superior domicile, a place to live for all eternity. I don't care what house you build here on earth, is it going to wear out someday? Is your body going to wear out someday? God says, I'm going to give you an incorruptible body. You can eat all the ribeye and stuffing and gravy and always say the perfect ideal weight. I was told to be on the ideal weight. I'm just too short. If I was 7'2", I'd be perfect. I'm under tall. <laughs> Some of you might be overweight. You might be the right height. I'm not. I'm just under tall. But in heaven, it'll be perfect. Billy's, Billy's back there saying amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, Billy's the same boat. You're under tall? <laughs> but so David says, God, why would you do this for us? And the answer is, it's not because of us. It's because of God, as we just read. Verse 21, uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse 20 of chapter 17. O Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Psalm 127, 1, Solomon writes uh, Psalm 127, and all of us know this verse, I'm sure you've heard it, except, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Except... The Lord keep the city, the watchman watches in vain. You've heard me many times from this pulpit say, folks, as Autumn Creek, we have to be so careful that we don't start going this way or we don't start going this way, but we perfectly follow what God has told us to do as, as Autumn Creek Baptist Church. If God's not building this church, all this is a waste of time. If God's not the cornerstone, the foundation of everything we do as a church, we're, we're just wasting. It's in vain. It just says, Solomon said it's in vain. That's why it's so important. You've heard me a few weeks ago, I said, if you see something, you know something, there's a ministry that you're, you want to run with, let us know. Uh, you, you know, Billy's back here, Danny's up here. I promise you there's a lot more spiritual wisdom in the 85-ish of you than there is the three of us. So if you have something to say, an email, a phone call, some wisdom to put in, come, let's come reason together, let's find God's purpose, let's find God's will for individuals in the church as well as the ministries in the church, as well as this church moving forward. I am convinced, we're roughly 40 years this church has been here. Has anyone been here? I don't see Barbara today. Anyone been here 40 years? Folks, there's another 40 years coming. We, we, we pray for these little ones up here. 40 years from today, realistically, who's still going to be here potentially? I tell you, it won't be us. Most of them in this room won't be here 40 years from today. Maybe you. <laughs> we can change that. <laughs> well, a lot of us in this room won't be here. And that's why it's so critically important that while we're here, while there's light, while there's daylight, we can work in the fields of our, of our Lord and Savior and, and reap the harvest of this community in any way we can. And say, God, our heart is with you. Our heart is seeking and saving. Our heart is building a spiritual building. N not this sheetrock and paint and shingles, 
But we want to build a spiritual building here at Autumn Creek. And each individual stone is precious. Each individual stone is a living stone, is a, someone that maybe you've been called out of the world. And verse 21 says, what, In what one nation in the earth is like your people, Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make you a name by great and terrible things and driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed out of Egypt. For your people Israel, you made your own people forever, and you, O Lord, became their God. So many of us could say that. God, I'm not worthy to be your servant. That would be a true statement. But in spite of that, God has called you anyway to be his servant. You're right, we're not worthy. And again, it goes back to we got to get ourselves out of the equation. Start focusing on God. You are an awesome God. There is no God like our God. There is no God like Jehovah. There's nothing this world has to offer that's like what God has to offer us. This world cannot offer you eternal spiritual blessings. There's only one that can do that. The first blessing is salvation. Interestingly, real briefly in Bible study today, we're talking about, and we're not going to go in this deep at all today, but the Abrahamic covenant, that's called an unconditional covenant. And this Davidic covenant we're looking at is an unconditional covenant. God says, I will build you a house. Is that based on us? If you're a believer in Christ, what did you, what input did you have in your salvation? Did you have any Jesus plus or was it Jesus and Jesus alone? Salvation is unconditional. God says, I will call you and you will be my people. The Mosaic covenant in between those two was conditional. God told Abraham, I will give you the land based on, I'm a God that gives land to people. I give blessings. The Mosaic covenant said, I gave you the blessing of the land, but while you're in the land, your blessings are conditional upon your obedience to me. That became a conditional blessing. And folks, I tell you this to say, there are those same blessings today. Your salvation is unconditional. It's based on what Christ did for you. You're not part of that equation. We know that from Genesis 15, which we talked about a few weeks ago, when Abraham went to sleep, and God put the animals, and he tore the animals apart, and they would cut a deal. We still have that phrase today, cutting a deal. Let's say me and Bob have a deal, and we would take, you know, thousands of years ago, we'd take a, a turtle dove and a goat and a, maybe a lamb or a cow. We'd cut it in half. We'd put half over there. We'd put half over here. And Bob and I would walk together and look at those animal parts and say, if either one of us breaks this covenant, this is what happens to us. This is what will happen to us if we break covenant. That's a pretty severe covenant breaking pretty severe penalty for that. But that was cutting a deal, and that word cutting a deal came from cutting animals up. And we know that back in Genesis 15, the Abrahamic covenant, it says God caught Abraham to go into a sleep, and it said God walked down there with a burning pot or a smoky fire went down. I believe that was God and Jesus walking down between those animals. And God told Abraham, if you break covenant, this will happen to one of us walking down the middle. Abraham broke covenant. Abraham didn't walk perfectly. So guess what happened to Jesus? Jesus stood in the atoning process for Abraham. So guess what happened to Jesus when Jesus showed up here on earth? He suffered. He was torn to pieces for, for our sins. We weren't part of that. We were the recipients of that blessing, but we weren't held responsible to hold the covenant perfectly. Can we hold God's covenant perfectly? Be holy as I am holy. Not a one of us can do that. No one in here, no human being ever born save Jesus Christ can be holy as God is holy. So if that's the covenant, we need someone to be our surety to honor that covenant. And that person is Jesus Christ. And we praise him for that, for taking our place. Now the Mosaic covenant, so that's salvation. Sanctification, this process after salvation until we're called home or Christ returns. Sanctification is they're now in the land. You've got the, the blessing. You're in the family. But now to get blessings, you have to be obedient. And you might be here today saying, well, God's not blessing me. God's not taking care of me. God doesn't give me joy and peace. And I, I don't have the things of the world that I would like. And God doesn't answer my prayers. And I, I told Kelly, they said, man, I don't know why I'm going to quit praying. I prayed for rain. It doesn't rain. I prayed for the rain to stop, and it pours. So maybe I just quit praying. You know, everything I ask for is backwards. But ultimately, if your prayer is God, whatever you want, I'm fine with. Is that a good prayer? Because then your prayers are always answered. With this sanctification process, we can deny ourselves blessings by disobedience. We're, yes, we're saved, but while we're in the land, the Mosaic Covenant was conditional. I will bless you. Yes, you're in the land. Yes, you have the blessing of the land. Yes, you have the blessing of salvation. But your blessings after that are contingent on your behavior. 
Are you trusting yourself or are you trusting God's word? And if you're trusting yourself, you're going to have limited blessings from God. You're going to, but the good news, you'll have his discipline. Is discipline a blessing? That's not necessarily the blessing we want, but that's a blessing also. Because when a father loves, he will punish. So we still have his blessing, but it might not be the blessings necessarily that we want. But he's still going to discipline us. But if we will obey his word, we will have joy, peace, all the fruits of the Spirit and the benefits of our salvation, the joy of our salvation. I, I dare say there's folks here today or watching at home that say, I know I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven, but I do not have, and I know I'm, I have salvation, but I don't have the joy of my salvation. Well, are you, are you following and obedient to God? Are you trusting Him? Or are you worried about the world? Are you worried about everything out there that's going on? Are you worried about be anxious for nothing? Do not be afraid. Are you obeying? Or are you worried about the storms of life? And the storms of life will steal your joy. So David here says, God, there's no one like you. You're awesome. And this Davidic covenant goes back to being an unconditional covenant. God the Father says, you're in the family, you're in the land. David, I'm going to put someone on a throne that's going to last forever. He will build me a house that will be forever, and he will sit on their throne forever. One of the main names Jesus called in the New Testament is uh, Jesus, uh, son of David. They knew who he was. The people then knew who he was. He said, this was the promised one. Many of the people knew who he was. And then when they called him son of David, they didn't say son of Solomon or son of Abraham or son of Adam. They said son of David. They're going back to some of these prophecies here saying, this is the, this is the one that God said he was going to send. Verse 25 says, for you, O oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build for him a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray before you. Now, O Lord, you are God, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. And now it has pleased you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord, have blessed, and it is blessed forever. You know, if God's blessed you, you are blessed how long? Forever. This is the God we serve. This is the God that we should follow with all of our strength, all of our mind, all of our heart. Everything that we are, this is the God that we should say, this is the God I will cling to. I will obey, I will follow. It may cost, but it, it, folks, it is worth it. This house we're looking for that comes to heaven, I mentioned, I think probably a month or so ago, I would mentioned how, and I've been thinking about this the last few weeks as we near this time, all of that we see, the stars, the planets, the sun, the moon, six days. Dwight brought up a, a passage in the Bible today, John 14, where we're told, do not let your hearts be troubled. Is that a command? Do not be afraid. Does that mean unless we want to be? Or does that mean do not be afraid? I have said a, a few weeks ago, the, 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 one of the biggest sins except in the church today is fear. Everyone, I'm so afraid of this, I'm so afraid of that, I'm worried, I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I'm upset. Quit sinning. We're commanded, do not be afraid. Satan loves when Christians are afraid. Well, if I go say something, what if somebody does something? What if somebody says something? What if, what if I make an enemy by proclaiming Jesus? Folks, they're not making an enemy of you, they're making an enemy of Jesus. They're not, they don't dislike you, they dislike Jesus. And the world, if you call his name, you will cause offense to the world. The Bible tells us that this chief cornerstone that God is building the foundation of his eternal home on, the temple, is Jesus Christ. That's the chief cornerstone. The Bible tells us, guess what the world did to that cornerstone? To the world has become a stumbling block. They stumble over the cross. They stumble over Jesus. Jesus can't do that for us. We have to do something for salvation. We have to earn our salvation. We have to pray five times a day. We have to fast. We have to, that gets us to heaven. Folks, that's blasphemy. That's heresy. Jesus died for sinners. That's the gospel truth. Anything else is a, is a lie from the devil. But John 14 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. In my Father's house there are many rooms. O King James, you might say, In my Father's house are many mansions. Whose house is he talking about? Jesus is saying, In my Father's house. This is the house they're talking about here in First Chronicles. Where David says, God, I want to build you a house. And God says, no, I'm going to send someone who's going to build a house for me. And Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. Who built this house? Jesus Christ did. Jesus said it this way to Peter. 
on this statement, on your profession of faith that I am the Son of God, I will build my church. We are the temple of God. Our, he resides in us. And we're brought together collectively as precious stones brought together, building the house of God for Him to reside in. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. If He did all of this physical in six days, how splendid is heaven going to be with Him working for 2,000 years? 2,000 years He's been building heaven. We read that passage, I has not seen, nor his ear heard, nor has the mind of man comprehended the things God has in store for his loved ones. You think of the majesty of this world, this universe, and he did that in six days, and he's been building heaven for 2,000 years for us. Gold probably doesn't describe what the streets of heaven are like. You know, I think in, in Revelation it says it was like this, it was like that, it was like and when John was describing heaven, it was like a sea of glass. It wasn't a sea. He says it's just, it was so spectacular. John said, I don't, there's not human words to describe what I'm seeing. I have to give metaphors and similes. So when those have been caught up into heaven have seen and given report back, they, there's not words. There's colors we don't know. God has, anyone seen the sunsets the last week or two? I see a lot of pictures. People just saying how spectacular was it, was it Christy Henry put that rainbow on Facebook or someone put a, there was a rainbow this last week and several, several people from here and different people and I took a picture, I was driving on I-10 the other day, I was over in Schulenburg, I took a picture and someone posted a picture and I said, that's the same rainbow I saw. Was it Trudy? Someone put some pictures from in here. Your dad did, Pete O'Hare did. Uh, and there were some other people too put pictures. I said, that's the same rainbow. I did the same thing, I took a picture of it. it that's just a rainbow here on earth. Think how spectacular heaven's going to be for us when we get there. It's going, to be, it's going to be incredible. And this gives us reason to say, God, we praise your name. We praise you. You've, you've called us out of darkness, and that's enough to praise you. You brought us into the kingdom of your son, and that's more reason to praise you. You're building a place for us in heaven for all eternity, and you're going to rule and reign and you're going to remove the penalty. You've already removed the penalty of sin from us. One day is going to come, you're going to move us from the presence of sin. If you're a believer, the penalty of sin no longer applies to you. What are the wages of sin? Eternal death no longer applies to you. The penalty has been removed. We're just waiting for the promise now. I talked to someone the other day. They were talking about buying a house. I think today someone said they're buying a house too. Giving that down payment is one thing. Having dinner in the house with your family and the fire on, that's a completely different thing. <laughs> Christ was the down payment. The Holy Spirit has been given to us the down payment. We're still waiting to inherit the kingdom. Folks, that kingdom will be an awesome kingdom. Folks, just start living today, kingdom. Just be, just be a member of the kingdom today. Walk in the light as He is in the light. Walk without fear in this world. Walk with a bold desire to seek and to save that which was lost. Help build the house. Bring in the broken stones. When we were in Nehemiah, it said how Ezra rebuilt the temple. That's the religious side. And then Nehemiah was building the, the walls, the secular side. We're kind of in that world today. We're building a temple, but we're still in the world. And I love that part of Nehemiah when you, you might remember that study a few months ago where it says they took the broken rocks and they reworked them. They put them into the wall. Folks, how many people in this community are broken rocks? They need to be reworked by God's mercy and grace and used for the kingdom. You might say, I once was a broken rock. I once was not what God designed me to be. The master builder, the master craftsman that was going to use me for his kingdom, but I started going over this way and the world beat me up and chiseled me and broke me and busted me apart, but God in his grace and his mercy put me back together. And God in his grace and his mercy is willing to use me a sinner for his kingdom business, who we have no business working alongside of Jesus Christ. But here's what the Word tells us. You are a co-laborer with Christ in the field. He doesn't need us. He wants us to work with Him. As we go into this Advent season, this Christmas season, many of us are going to turn our thoughts and minds to Christ. I would also encourage you to turn your thoughts and minds to the lost around us. We have Bethlehem City coming up Friday night. You might have plans. You might have this. You might have that. You might say... Father, use me for your kingdom somehow. 
put me in one of those costumes that Patsy made. I don't know what I'm doing. But if I can pass out a Bible, if I can pass out one Bible to somebody and say, God bless you, maybe that's what you've called me. I, I don't know, God. Here's what I do know. I want to do something. I want to get in the game, and I'm not sure what to do. We're trying to make opportunities. Men's ministry, women's ministry, the youth, the music, Bethlehem City, lots of opportunities. Just jump in. If God tells you don't do it, then don't do it. If you're deadly sick Friday night, don't come. <laughs> Trust me, we don't want you here. We'll miss you. But if you're able and, and willing, and, and probably most of you are able, it's that second part, willing. Just join in. I don't know what I'm doing, but if you maybe make hot chocolate or just be a greeter, just tell people, God loves you, Jesus loves you, thanks for coming tonight, we love you. Something that simple. You know, there's people, I think I've said before, the three, in every culture, in every language in the world, they said there's three phrases that every culture in the world lists at the very top of what they like to hear. I love you. Does God tell us that? I forgive you. Does the message tell us that? Dinner is served. <laughs> Those are the three phrases that says every culture in the world loves to hear that. Folks, if we just use our mouths, God loves you. We love you. You know there's people in this community who would probably like to hear that at this season? I saw, I have a friend on Facebook. She lives up in Dallas. It just broke my heart. She put on Facebook. If anyone has an empty chair Thanksgiving, my family's disowned me. And I'm an alcoholic. And I can't be alone this holiday. It will be dangerous for me. If you have an empty chair, could I please have it? I thought, you know the depth of pain that must be for someone to put that on a public forum like that? There are people desperately looking for godly love in this world and for a place to fit in. And we just read from the word, in my father's house are many rooms. All are welcome. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this message today. Father, we thank you so much for building a home for us, for building a family for us. Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters, our family right here at Autumn Creek, our members and visitors that we come together to worship and to serve you. Father, be with us this week as we go out into your fields. Help us to look at the fields as they're white unto harvest. There's people desperately looking for the truth, and we have the truth. Father, we ask your blessing on Bethlehem City this coming Friday and Saturday evening. Father, we don't know what's going to happen, but we know we're willing to serve you. We're asking that your word would not go out void. They would accomplish the purposes you would have. Father, we, we look forward to the day we might say that someone came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior through such a simple little thing as, as this Bethlehem City project. Maybe scorned by the world, or ridiculed, Father, but in your kingdom, a mighty work. Father, we thank you for the servants of our church that are here. Father, be with us again as we leave. Help those that are sick and have uh, illnesses, both physical and spiritual. Father, heal them up. Let them know this is a place where we are family. We love one another, and we love one another because you first loved us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.